Uh, good morning to everyone. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you today. Uh, you have graciously allowed me to come from time to time, and I always look forward to the opportunity of being back at my mother church in Dallas. This is where the Lord got me in reformed thinking, right here, through your great pastor, S. Lewis Johnson. Uh, I'm also grateful to, uh, to the elders that they've given me a chance to do some work in the Johnson archives. So that's a project I won't talk about. But someday, <clears throat> I hope I can give a big lecture about it right here. But that, I don't know when that will be done, but I, as a historian, I'm having fun going through all those records and reliving some great moments. So thank you. Today, I'm going to be turning your attention in God's Word to Colossians chapter 1. As you know, Colossians is one of the epistles of Paul. It's often considered as a twin to the book of Ephesians. Not an identical twin, but uh, clearly he was thinking similar issues to another church in Asia Minor, what we'd call modern-day Turkey, where he wrote uh, the, to the church in Colossae. This particular study is going to be looking at the supremacy of Christ, the preeminence of Christ is seen in his person and work. My message later today and our worship service will carry that on as we look at Hebrews chapter 1. In fact, there are three great uh, chapters that help us to think about who Christ is. John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1. They are a trilogy of Christological passages that elevate our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this passage, I want you to consider uh, that there's many things we could say, but I'm going to be focusing especially at verses 15, uh, then down through verse 23. But I'm going to read for us the entire passage just so we can get the flow of thought. And so I'm going to start reading, if you will, at verse uh, 9, and I'll read then through verse 23. So here's the reading of God's Word, the section that we will be considering in our study today. Verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And now the passage where we will focus on more fully, beginning at verse 15. He, speaking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." Thus far, the reading of God's Word. Isn't that an extraordinary passage? When I hear that, I said, who could have ever written the, those? Just one thought, it's overwhelming. How can you take it all in? Well, let's thank the Lord for it as we pray. Lord, we praise you for these beautiful uh, insights, powerful words 
doctrinal truths, life-giving energy of the Spirit for our hearts. Oh Lord, we ask that you would use these things to strengthen us, to bring us joy in our service for you, and to equip us to be faithfully your people in all that we do. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who indeed is preeminent, supreme of all, the Lord of lords and King of kings. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, in this passage, we're going to be looking, as I said, starting at verse 15. What we saw at the beginning is Paul's prayer for the uh, Colossians. He asked that they might grow in the knowledge of Christ. And I'll just pause to say that the word that he uses is really a Greek word that all of you know if you just take a moment. The word no. You know what no means, right? Well, the word ginosko is the Greek word to know. And it's a word that is different from the intellectual knowledge the Bible often describes as oida, what you know intellectually. Ginosko is an experiential knowledge. It's living. But then the word goes a little bit farther. It adds... Paul adds the prefix epi. We have some doctors here who can tell us about the epidermis or epidemic, etc. It means upon. He's saying, I'm writing to you so that you'll have an experiential knowledge that's so great that it's intensely knowledge. It's knowledge upon knowledge. It's experience so great that you can't shake it. It stirs you all the way inside. He'll use that word in various ways here. So the intense personal knowledge of who this Christ is. That's what he's praying for. And then as he has prayed, he describes what God the Father has done. These first verses from 9 through 14 basically are a passage on sovereign grace. If we had time to study them with care, it would say, do you know why you're a Christian? You were in quicksand. You were in the miry clay. You were going down. And he has delivered you out of that. But Paul goes on to say he didn't pull you out of the mud and then just leave you on the beach. He's taken you all the way to his home. He's taken you from the miry clay to his very family. Sovereign grace is clearly here. Boy, I'd love to preach that. You didn't give me enough time. I need a whole week to get through this. So we're going to start at verse 15. In my Bible, it has the heading, The Preeminence of Christ. Okay, so Paul has told us he's praying that you really know who Christ is. He's put it in the context of the sovereign grace of God that's brought you to Christ. And now he wants to say how great Christ is. And if you don't mind, I'm going to make the same point both in Sunday school as well in our worship service. This needs to be highly emphasized in our day. Now there's... Uh, several high reasons why we need to emphasize the preeminence of Christ. Because most evangelicals today believe we have a Jesus who died on the cross, who is just a really great man that God loved to use for our salvation. Did you know that the Barna Group, working with Ligonier Ministries, has done a study? And of the group of people called evangelicals, let's say 100% of the evangelicals, people say, I believe I'm saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. 45% of those people do not believe that Jesus is God. Now that's pretty tragic. Evangelicals, good news people that say we have a Savior, but He's just a man. That's the reality we're living in. And now that is not only a tragic reality, it also challenges the very history of Christianity. Now because you all are good mathematicians, if you take this year 2023, can you add two to it? What year is that? 2025. Now you expect a historian to give you an anniversary, right? That's good. It gives us job security. So I'm, I'm trying to keep myself in business for a couple more years here. Okay. Why is 2025 so big? Well, it's the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea, which gave us the Nicene Creed. Have you ever heard the Nicene Creed? Remember those words? God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance with the Father. 
Those words will be said by millions of people all around the world today, whether we understand what they mean or not. The Nicene Creed will have a big anniversary. But we don't believe something just because the historic church has said it. We are committed to finding a theology that's based upon the revealed Word of God. And here we're going to find the basis why Christ is, in fact, preeminent. And I hope that Believer's Chapel will say, we're going out to remind people who Jesus really is. He's not just someone who sacrificed his life like a great fireman or marine on the beach. This is a sovereign God of the universe who died on the cross to save sinners. So as we come to verse 15 then, I'm going to violate all the homiletical rules I've ever learned. You're supposed to only have a a sermon that never gets past three points. I'm going to give you a 15-point study today, okay? Well, a five-point Calvinist times three, what are you going to do with that? I'm really super Calvinistic today. So now you can't keep track of all of them, but I hope you'll number them in your Bible, okay? Now, because I'm also a teacher, I'm allowed to add some extra memory devices to a passage like this. So... You're starting at verse 15, and I'm going to give you 15 points that follow from it. So you can say 15 gives you 15. How about that? That's one. Second thing is, did you know that the number 15 is a very sacred number? You say, how is that possible? Well, probably you know that in the Greek language, as well as in the Hebrew language, in antiquity, they used the order of the alphabet to establish numbers. So A, B, C, if you will, or one, two, three, and so on. Okay, so that's how you did numbers. Like the Roman numerals, you know, those are letters, but they're numbers. So the, the letters become numbers. And so in Hebrew, the fifth letter and the tenth letter <clears throat> are put together to write 15. And that gives us, if you will, a Y and an H in Hebrew. But then you say, wait a second, Y and H, that's the holy name of God, Yahweh. And they said, we can't make the holy name of God number 15 because we'll be using God's name for common, ordinary things. We can't use YH for 15. So in Hebrew, they write it 9 and 6. They take the next letters, and it's still... So we have any mathematician? Is that called the commutative principle of arithmetic or something like that? I've forgotten my mathematics training here. It still works. So it's 9 and 6. Why? Because 15 actually spells the name of God. Okay, well, there's a good another memory device to use here. Verse 15 gives you 15 points in which the preeminence of Christ will show you that he is God. Now, isn't that a nice memory device? Put that to work. So you say Colossians 1, verse 15, 15 points on the deity of Christ. Okay, now see if I can number them for you, okay? Get your pen out and start writing with me here. Okay, verse uh, 15, the first part. He is the image of the invisible God. So what we see first, number one, the incarnation The becoming of a man by the divine nature is the true image of God. We all know from Genesis 1, we are made in the image of God. But this is the true image of God. So much so that you remember in the upper room, Jesus could say, Philip, have you been with us so long that you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the image of God the ultimate image of God. The preeminence of Christ is established because when we see Him, we see the one that cannot be seen. He is the union of God and man in one. Who could stop right there? That's deity. But Paul says, wait, we got more. Let's go to number two. Look at the second part of verse 15. He's the firstborn of all creation. And what that's, the word firstborn here is saying, this is the one that's the royal figure. He he is fully equal 
The king has his firstborn and who is the heir of everything. He is the heir of all creation. When we go to Hebrews chapter 1, we'll find that point emphasized. He is the heir of everything. He is, if you will, then in creation. Creation is all about the Son, Jesus Christ. He is preeminent over all creation. In fact, that point is further developed, so we keep 15b along with verse 16 as part of the same number. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Wow, what is he saying here? Anything you see in creation, it was all done through Christ. That brings us back to the very creation account. And God said, God spoke. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And nothing came into being except through that creative word. He is the word of God in creation. And of course, stop and think, you came with a lot of words. I came with a lot of words. You're hearing a lot of words. Guess what? Those words are already one with me. They come out of me. They're inside. My words are me. And I'm letting you hear them. That's the whole point. The word of God comes from the inside of God. They're one with him. God never had to learn his word. This is what he is. So he is, if you will, the firstborn of all creation. It's by him all things were created. It doesn't matter whether it's heaven and earth, whatever powerful authorities in the heavenly realms or in the earthly realm, all of these are through him, and more than that, they're for him. That's the point. He's the firstborn of all creation. He is the heir of everything. All of that is for, it's through him, and it's for his benefit. Did you realize everything you do is actually for Jesus Christ? Even the unbeliever. What he is doing is touching the world where Jesus is involved in everything. For it was created through him. He is the word. And he will receive it all. It is his. Okay, so he is preeminent in his person, as we see in his incarnation, in his creation of all things. Notice verse 17 for number three. He is preeminent over all things because of his pre-existence, verse 17a. And he is before all things. He is here before the world ever was because he is an eternal being who is God of God, very God, light of light, begotten, not made, being of the same substance with the Father. But notice further in that same verse, number four, we see his preeminence in his providential governance of the world. 17b, the second part of the verse, it says this, And in him all things hold together. Okay, now if we have any physicists here, you now have the reason why gravity works. You now have the reason why the strong force keeps all those protons together when like forces should push each other apart. You're seeing that the one that's keeping it all together is it's the creator. And it's the preeminent one is Jesus Christ. That's pretty extraordinary that we can't understand physics properly without understanding that every fact is a Christ fact. Jesus is involved in the smallest electron field that you can imagine. He's the one that's keeping physicists confused with the quantum mechanics because he's the only one that can predict where that electron will be next. He's the sovereign God over all things. By him, everything consists, holds together, and doesn't fly apart into disorder. And you know this whole universe is under a curse. The second law of thermodynamics says the whole universe is wearing away, running out. Cars rust out, they don't paint themselves. Roofs leak, they don't replace themselves. And while we keep replacing cells, finally we run out. The outer man is wearing away. But he is the one that makes all the processes hold together, that keeps order in a world that's still under the sovereignty of God, even though it's cursed. He holds us together. So that's number four. Number five, we see his preeminence. 
in his rule of the church, 18a. And he is the head of the body, the church. And so what he's saying is, is I'm not only looking at the cosmic reality, I'm looking at God's saving purpose in history. The body of people that belong to God. He is the head of the spiritual reality of redemption. And I often make a point when I mention this verse. If you're in a church and you never hear the name of Jesus, you better get out. Because you're basically supposed to be worshiping in the throne room of the king. And you're ignoring him. Or you're denying him. Or you're insulting him. To talk about yourself and everything else. About your best life now. Like this is all there is. Is to shame the God of the universe. Jesus Christ who's the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. He should have preeminence. If you come to a church and you never hear the name of Jesus... You have insulted the one who is the head of everything, the preeminence of Christ. Thank God that's not true of Believer's Chapel. Jesus is Lord here. May he ever be recognized as such. Well, number six, his preeminence is seen, if you will, in his resurrection. You take a look at the next verse. He is the firstborn from the dead. Again, he is the royal inaugurated <clears throat> ruler of resurrection. Now we know others were raised from the dead. Jesus raised some earlier. But they were raised to face death yet again. And they were raised by someone else. But Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And the Father loves me because I take it back up. You know, it's fascinating when that day came. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out. He couldn't even walk. He was bound. I don't know how he hobbled out or floated out or what happened. And I remember one preacher saying, it's a good thing Jesus remembered to say the name Lazarus. The whole cemetery would have come out. He is the firstborn of resurrection power. There's no one else like him. He is the one that can look at the grave and say, it's not the end. Death will be swallowed up in victory because of who Christ is. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, which then brings us to number eight. If you want any proof of what we're saying, that Christ should have preeminence in all things, it says it directly. This basically is the summary. Isn't it interesting? It's right in the middle of these 15. Okay, it's right the middle point. You're built to eight, you're going to have up to 15. Number eight, what is it? That in all things, in everything, he might have the preeminence. He's the incarnate one of God and man. He is the beginning and end and means of creation. He existed before all things. He's holding everything together. He's the head of the church. He's the one that has created resurrection, reality, and power. And so in everything, he should be first, not last, not forgotten, not overlooked, not minimized. He should be first. Maybe this is a good point to just stop for an application. How important is Jesus in your life? I'm going from preaching to meddling now, so I've got to be careful here. Is Jesus really that important to you? I mean, that's the point that Paul's getting at. Do we, oh yeah, I've got to remember Jesus at Sunday. Or is it, I can't touch an atom in this universe, see a sunrise anywhere, read a book, hear a word, enjoy music, eat a meal, dig in my garden, Enjoy my grandchild, go to my doctor without engaging Jesus Christ. He's everywhere. He's preeminent in everything. There was a time people understood this, and that's why we numbered our whole history by before Christ and Anno Deo in the year of our Lord. He is the one that brings it all together. He's first above all things. Well, let's keep going. Number, number nine. His preeminence is seen in his cosmic reconciliation. In everything, in his full possession of deity. Number eight is uh, in the possession of full deity. Let's read verse 19. For in him, that is in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell 
This verse is extraordinary because it's saying that in Christ, all that God is, the fullness of God, everything that makes God to be God has been brought to live within this Christ. God was pleased to do that. You remember as you listen to the story of Jesus, this is my beloved son, hear him. He is loved by the Father. All of God's presence is in him. Yes, according to Philippians 2, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He emptied himself by taking on human nature, not by subtracting any of his deity. And now he's been given a name that's above every name because he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And now he's been raised to glory and he has a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father. He is preeminent in his possession of full deity as he came. There's no inadequacy in him. That cosmic reconciliation uh, that I mentioned earlier is especially I, number 9, num verse 20. Let's read it. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And so the point of reconciliation is the idea of things that are at odds, enemies. They come together to be one. In our theology, we, in the English language, have created a word. We don't find it directly in the Bible, but it's hinted at by this word reconciliation. It's the word atonement. If you look carefully at the word atonement, it's an old English word that means at one meant. It's the process of taking enemies and making them one. That's reconciliation. That's what the cross did. On the cross, Jesus brought the fallenness of humanity into unity with the holy God by the price that he paid. But here, the reconciliation is cosmic in proportions. Notice how broad it is in verse 20. And through this Jesus, who's preeminent in everything, he's reconciling to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. The day will come when there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and it'll be the same creative word that made this first universe that will make all things new. And as we are grieving all of us for many things, every tear will be wiped from our eyes. The former things will pass away, and they'll be remembered no more. So take the worst day of your life and the greatest sorrow and pain you've ever had and realize that the glory that shall be revealed in us will be so great, those things will be forgotten. That's what we're praying for our friends in Nashville right now. All of us have connections there. This is hit really close to home. We have nothing to say from a human vantage point, but we have so much to say from a divine vantage point. Reconciliation will come isn't it wonderful to know that those little believing children, the first thing they saw when they opened their eyes was the face of Jesus. And if you were to ask them, do you want to go back and see mama and daddy? They said, no, this is where I belong. That's the beauty of what we have. The cosmic reconciliation has come close to home. And that's the next point, number 10 in the efficacy of his cross. Look at the last part of verse 20. It says, making peace by the blood of his cross. Today, I want to pause and just say, are you at enmity with God? Are you fighting with the Lord? Maybe you've never believed you are going through the motions. Jesus has given the cross as a symbol that he has died so that you'd be one with him. And he says unto you through his cross, come unto me, all of you that are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you'll find rest, peace, shalom through my cross. He's calling you to himself. 
And maybe you have peace with Christ, but that's where you'll find peace as you feel the troubledness in your soul, as you deal with all the burden of this heinous crime that we're thinking of, with the struggles of illness and disease, the heartbreak and setback of broken relationships, or uh, financial struggles, or just the process of aging and pain. We all face these things. Ah, but there is peace at His cross because the best is still yet to come. That's wonderful. We continue to look. Those first 10 of our 15 points give us the preeminence in His person, and it took us all the way to number 10 to get to His work. Can I just pause there for a moment? We started out by saying how many people say, oh, I've, I believe in His cross. I don't believe that He's God. Well, Paul's just made nine statements to get you ready to understand why the cross is so important. Because it wasn't just a good guy. It was God. It was the fullness of God. It was the creator of the universe, the sustainer of every atom. This is the one who's come to lay down his life for us. When you preach the gospel without the majesty of the God of the universe, you have truncated it, you've abridged it, you've diminished it. You certainly have not elevated the preeminence of Christ. You've not made him supreme. You just, you just kind of made him special. He's not special. He's God. That's the point. So in this first section then, our first 10 points of starting at verse 15, 15 that adds up in Hebrew to the name of God. These are proofs of the preeminence of Christ, showing he's divine. We see his preeminence in his person and Lastly, the accomplishment of redemption, the first ten. Now, the next three is the preeminence of Christ in his application of redemption. Now, we need to make a difference between the accomplishment of redemption and the application of redemption. Jesus accomplished our redemption, and he made it clear when he said, It is finished. The word means fully paid, nothing more to do. We don't have to add anything more to his finished work. We can simply say, Jesus, thank you. You've done it all. But that finished work needs to be applied to our lives. It has been accomplished. Now it must become personalized. We must possess it. And again, I would stop and just pause. Maybe you know a lot about what Christ did, but you've never said, it's yours. God is sovereign in applying it to our hearts, but we're responsible to receive and act in faith upon that gift. And so in the next three points that we find here in verses 21 through 22, we see Christ's preeminence in his application of this redemption. So number 11, if you're numbering them, let's look now at verse 21, and we see in personal salvation... We see Christ's preeminence in our own personal salvation as it's applied to us. We read, and you, he's writing to the Colossians, and by implication, all Christians that are learning from apostolic teaching, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. And so we stop there and Paul says, what Christ accomplished on the cross is now to be a, a reality that comes right here to our own hearts. And notice how it comes to us. It comes with the bad news that you and I were aliens. We don't belong naturally to Christ. We're enemies. We're outside His fault. We're hostile in mind. In our minds, we're thinking things of hatred and contempt against our neighbor, against God, and sometimes against ourselves. We do evil deeds. We are actively disobeying God's Word. Nobody likes to be called bad. But if you don't get this right, you don't understand the good news of the gospel. We need to realize that when we measure ourselves not by one another, but by God, we fall short. Hey, you might be better than everybody in this room today, 
but you're not good enough to be right with God. You know, the standard is pretty hard. You remember what Jesus said? Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody ever measure up to that? Man, if salvation was being perfect, I would not have survived the minute of walking if I was perfect from the study over here because, man, people are going to love my sermon today. There's pride. I know you don't love it. I see many of you sleeping out there. I'm trying to wake you up now and give you a little pep talk. Okay? So I always comfort myself by remembering God gives his loved ones rest. If you need to sleep in my message, it's okay. I also learned that a nodding audience doesn't always mean agreement. You know, so, <laughs> so at any rate, okay, a little laughter is good for the soul. So now we're ready to keep going, right? Okay. Is this personalized? You are a sinner. I'm a sinner. But we're reconciled, the one sinners. This is now the application. This is number 11. Notice number 10 and 11 come after all of this emphasis on the majesty of our God, Jesus Christ. He's God, who's our Savior. Notice number 12, as we come to verse uh, 22, part B and C. It mentions the fact that he, in his body of flesh by his death, why did he do this? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Christ is preeminent, not only in applying personal salvation to you, but it's preeminent, number 12, in applying sanctification to you. Sanctification is not you're just doing everything you can do to make yourself really good. You know, you just can't make yourself good enough. But Christ not only saved you, he did this in order to present you. He sees you as a gift he's going to give to the Father as holy like God, separate from the sin and death and curse of this world, and blameless. He wants to see you someday standing before the Lord, cleansed, having made progress, and where you didn't do it all, Jesus says, I complete it with my righteousness, and you'll stand above reproach. This is to be the aim of every Christian's life. We call it mortification and vivification. We are seeking to put to death the deeds of the flesh. It's a daily reality. Vivification is saying, I want to learn to live more in the resurrected life of Christ. I want to live in obedience to the Lord. This is a process that we do, but this is what Christ is preeminent in doing because we are hoping to be conformed to our Savior, to be like Christ. Well, number 13, notice the, the preeminence in his application of redemption. Not just 11, personal salvation. Not just 12, in sanctification so that we can stand holy before God through Christ's work. But number 13, in the singularity of commitment to his gospel. That this is something we should be one-minded about. This is what we focus on, what we persevere in, what we continue in, and we don't stop working at it is the perseverance of the saints that goes along with the preservation of the saints. God keeps us, but we are to continue to be faithful. And we all fail, don't we? We need to come back to the cross again. Say, Lord, forgive me. Now help me to live for you today. To take a step, and this time not to slip in that mud puddle like I did last week. Let me learn to go around it. I got cleaned up. I'm not going to make the same mistake. Help me to be a new person. Help me to be more like you, Jesus. And so listen how he puts this, number 13, the singularity of commitment to his gospel and perseverance. 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Paul says, you need to keep on believing. You need to keep on working. And it's fascinating as you look at these words, he not only says to continue believing that you are to become stable and steadfast, not shifting. Now, I don't know if you know anything about uh, plate tectonics and earthquakes, but you know the place that has more earthquakes than just about any place on earth is Asia Minor. Didn't We just heard of a gigantic earthquake that killed thousands of people in Turkey. This is language that's saying you need to have a foundation that is firm. 
That, if you will, is the word that's used originally here that means stable. Further, steadfast, it's the word that has reinforced pillars. You need to have spiritual rebar in your soul, standing strong. And therefore, you're not shifting. You're not wiggling as the world shakes. You're standing strong. It's interesting, the word for shifting here is from where we get the word kinesiology and kinetics, the study of movement. Saying, you're not to be moving all the time. Oh, I'm really close to Jesus today. Oh, I'm really ticked off at Jesus today. I really want to live for the Lord today. I'm, I think I'm going to be with the world today. No, I'm continuing on. I'm not giving up. I'm focusing. Christ is preeminent in everything. He's preeminent in saving me. He's preeminent in my sanctification. So he'll be preeminent in my daily choices. I may have failed yesterday, but I'm going to keep going to where I'm supposed to be going. This is the discipline of godliness. And it's personal. Christ is preeminent as you're making your daily choice to live faithfully to him. Now, I see I'm running out of time, and so I have to be quick. I am to point three, which is really point 14. So I got, there's hope I can bring this plane in. I'm going to try. Number 14. Notice what Paul will say as we now look at uh, verse 23b, the last part. He says, Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. What we see here, number 14, is the global sweep of Christ's great commission. Jesus is preeminent because there's no place where his gospel should not be preached. He has been given authority over all. That means there's no closed country in the earth where the gospel shouldn't go. There's no one that can say, don't bring Bibles here. We smuggle them in and we're not sinning. Can't say, don't you dare talk about Jesus. We will whisper his name like the Lullards did with John Wycliffe in England. We'll keep, it's illegal, it doesn't matter. Jesus says we do it, we're not sinning. He is the one that's sovereign over all of history. In the global sweep, in all creation under heaven, the gospel is to be heard. It is the preeminent message. So the final third point is the preeminence in the gospel proclamation, number 14, the Great Commission. And finally, lastly, 15, the preeminence of Christ in the gospel proclamation is seen and none other than the writer of this epistle, Saul of Tarsus, who is now Paul the Apostle. Notice how he says it? This gospel that's been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. How does Paul know that? Because that's what he's doing. He's going everywhere. He doesn't care what stones are thrown at him, what shipwrecks may come, what opposition or condemnation or marginalization or death threats. He's proclaiming it everywhere. And he says, and of which I... Paul became a minister. And when he says, I, Paul, he's asking you, do you remember who I am? I was killing Christians. I hated Christ. I was going everywhere, rounding up people. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Jew of the Jews. According to the law, I was without blemish. I knew it all. I was a teacher. But the preeminence of Christ found me on the road to Damascus. And Jesus, the preeminent one, brought me to know who I've just described. I said, who are you, Lord? He knew he was the Lord. Paul knew he was preeminent. As we conclude today, we have here a wonderful summary of who our Lord Jesus Christ is and who he is to be in your life. Is he preeminent? Is he first? If we understand what we've said here, you cannot separate the person of Christ from the work of Christ. His cross makes no sense until you understand he is God who laid down his life for his sheep. Let's give him the glory he's worthy of. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share this passage that is your word. And we thank you for your preeminence so mightily seen 
in these 15 items that we've summarized. And we pray that more of the glory of which you are due will be part of our lives, of our words, of our actions, of our thoughts, of our ministries, of our daily activities, and that you would be truly the Lord of all. We praise you and thank you. And Jesus, we love you. In your great name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed. Come back. We're starting in 10 minutes or more. <laughs>